Hello everyone. Today I wanted to continue my coverage of the Jeffrey Epstein saga and looking into a gentleman named Leon Black, the former CEO of Apollo Capital Management. Uh, this is an individual with ties to the CIA, as we will see. If you have not been following my reporting on the Jeffrey Epstein Gillen Maxwell saga, you can find my articles on the Patriot Soapbox website or on my Substack, radixverum.substack.com. I covered the Gillen Maxwell trial and I've done a lot of reporting looking into Jeffrey Epstein's associates, people like Leslie Wexner, for example, who has yet to be charged with anything. But um, today I wanted to talk about Leon Black because there is a lawsuit currently going on with his former mistress, uh, a Russian model, and she has made some allegations about Mr. Black and Jeffrey Epstein. So I thought it would be interesting to look at that today. Um, we'll go ahead and pull up a couple things that I have um, that I've prepared here. So this is the most recent amended complaint that she has filed. You can see the case number here. This is in um, New York. Her name is Guzel Geneva. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but that's how I'm going to pronounce it. So she's asked for a jury trial. This is the second amended complaint, and this was filed um, on, uh, it looks like it was received on March 9th, or I'm sorry, May 9th, 2022. So this is quite recent, quite up to date. Plaintiff Guzal Geneva brings a second amended complaint against defendant Leon Black and hereby alleges as follows. On April 8, 2021, Bloomberg published an article that contained the following statements by defendant Leon Black about plaintiff Guzal Geneva, quote, I foolishly had a consensual affair with Miss Geneva that ended more than seven years ago, unquote. Black said in the statement Thursday, quote, any allegation of harassment or any other inappropriate behavior towards her is completely fabricated. The truth is that I have been extorted by Miss Ganeva for many years, and I made substantial monetary payments to her based on her threats to go public concerning our relationship in an attempt to spare my family from public embarrassment." Unquote. Black had previously planned to step down by the end of July as CEO of the firm he co-founded. He said that, on advice from his counsel, he asked criminal authorities several weeks ago to investigate Geneva. So they have cited here that Bloomberg article. Black says he paid to hide a fare, denies it led to Apollo exit. Two. Everything that Black said in the above statement about Miss Ganeva is false. First, Black did not have a quote unquote consensual affair with Miss Ganeva. Second, any telling of quote unquote harassment or quote unquote inappropriate behavior by Black toward Miss Ganeva is not fabricated. As described below, such words do not come close to the appalling forced sexual misconduct that Black inflicted on her. Third, Black has never been quote extorted by Miss Ganeva unquote, much less for quote unquote many years. Disgustingly, he used his extreme power and wealth to coerce her into signing an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, in October of 2015, precisely because he knew what he had done to her was shocking, evil, and exposed him to potential criminal charges. Three, the only repeated threats for many years came from Black to Miss Ganeva that if she did not sign the NDA, take his hush money, and retreat into silence forever, she would feel the brunt of his true wrath. 
He said many times to her, quote, if you do not take the money, I will put you in prison, unquote. Quote, if you do not take the money, I will destroy your life, unquote. Number four, fourth, Miss Ganeeva never, quote, threatened to go public, unquote, about Black regarding anything. As the people within Black's inner circle know, the suggestion that Black attempted to spare his family public embarrassment about their involvement is ridiculous. Five, for years, Black ate countless meals with Miss Ganeeva in five-star restaurants, took her to Broadway shows, numerous art shows, museum exhibitions, private parties, the movies, including the premiere of The King's Speech, and even sat beside her while he cheered for the New York Knicks at MSG. In the midst of all these very public outings, Black never once worried about sparing his family from public embarrassment. There's a footnote here. Nor did he care about being seen out with other young women, often of Russian descent, in addition to Miss Ganeeva. In fact, he never worried about people associating him with Miss Ganeeva because he enjoyed being seen with her in public. What Black has worried about, however, is being exposed for the sadist that he is. 6. On October 29, 2020, during an earnings call in connection with his announcements about his future role at Apollo Global Management, quote-unquote Apollo, Black publicly stated, quote, there has never been an allegation by anyone that I engaged in any wrongdoing because I did not, unquote. 7. This and similar subsequent false claims by Black, including his January 25th, 2021 statement in connection with his quote-unquote retirement as CEO of Apollo, in which he stated, quote, I did not engage in any wrongdoing or inappropriate conduct, unquote, in relation to Jeffrey Epstein, served as the tipping point for Miss Ganeeva. Having recently educated herself in law school and knowing that many of Black's sexual acts were against her will and without her consent, she no longer was willing to stand by and allow him to escape accountability. Eight. Knowing that her public outing of his disgusting conduct would surely end any further monetary payments from Black, i.e. his hush money, quote-unquote, she did so regardless. 9. On March 17, 2021, Ms. Ganeeva bravely posted on Twitter that Black was a quote-unquote predator that had, quote, sexually harassed and abused, unquote, her for years. The next morning, Black texted Ms. Ganeeva to call him immediately. She refused. 10. Knowing that he could no longer control her into silence, Black resorted to a tact that has been used by wealthy and powerful men like him who had committed sexual misconduct. He made a preemptive claim of extortion. Footnote 3. Too many examples exist to include here of wealthy male sexual harassers re-victimizing their victims by accusing these women of extortion after they came forward. A number of high-profile examples, some of whom also have close ties to Black, as described below, are detailed infra at um, 2.32, threats of extortion are potentially far more damaging and frightening to a female accuser uh, than threats of a civil lawsuit for defamation, an option that numerous men accused of sexual misconduct use for similar reasons. 11. By making a baseless or manufactured quote-unquote extortion claim, the female accuser is victimized one more time in a public way often including threats of criminal charges. As demonstrated by Black, this is accomplished by his going to the criminal authorities, quote-unquote, to accuse Ms. Ganeeva of extortion and placing her on the legal defensive before she can take any legal action against him, just in case she planned on or considered doing so. 12. Although heinous and disgusting, Miss Ganeeva has been threatened by Black for years that if she disobeyed him, he would quote-unquote put her in prison, and to speak out would be quote-unquote suicide. 
13. For too long, wealthy and powerful men like Black have enjoyed an unequal and grossly imbalanced access to justice, unavailable to the average man or woman and non-millionaires. Knowing the right lawyers and politicians provided Leon Black with the ability to do exactly as he said, quote, ask criminal authorities to investigate Geneva, unquote. 14. Threatening that a criminal charge would be brought against Miss Geneva, first will not save Black from the truth about what he has done, nor will she be deterred by any baseless, retaliatory, and unlawful counterclaims that have been asserted against her in this action, despite the immense potential liability and risks these claims could mean. As chronicled below, the truth will reveal a violent, abusive, predatory, vindictive, and brutal side to Black that he has shielded from public view for decades. 15. Black defamed Miss Geneva by making the above statements. So let's get into the factual allegations. Number one. Leon Black's orchestrated secrecy of his sexual violence and deviance. 20. Like a master chess player, Black was many moves ahead of Miss Geneva from the moment he met her. Black pissed uh, picked Miss Geneva out of a crowd on March 8, 2008, while attending an International Women's Day event held at Donald Engel's UES home. Donald Engel knew Black from Drexel Burnham. It has been alleged that it was Donald Engel who arranged for the beautiful quote unquote girls to be present at the infamous annual Drexel Burnham conferences that came to be known as the Predators Ball. Lynette Lopez, here's what happened when I went to Vegas with 1,800 hedge fund managers, an article from Business Insider of 2014. Miss Geneva was invited by a woman who she knew through modeling. This woman also knew Black. The event included Russian musicians and a number of other Russian-speaking guests, including other models, 21. A single mother in her early 20s, she was 25, having moved from Russia to the U.S. by herself, it was easy work for Black to convince Miss Ganeva to dine with him at La Grinnell, where he planned to tell her how he could help her with her quote-unquote future. 22. This is exactly what Black did. 23. It was a choreographed plan that allowed him to quickly gain Miss Geneva's trust. Common sense suggests that he had used this tactic before, and in fact, Miss Geneva later met at least two other women that were similarly involved with Black. Over the course of several dinners, Black repeatedly praised Miss Geneva on her innate talent and intellect, arranged, quote-unquote, a few appointments for her, for example, one with Creative Artists Agency in L.A. These efforts helped him quickly gain her gratitude and admiration. 24. Miss Geneva was pleased that a successful businessman that she admired found her conversation and company enjoyable. As the person in charge of thousands of employees, Miss Geneva believed Black understood the value and importance of reliable, secure employment and intended to help her move beyond simply modeling. Naively, Miss Geneva believed Black was not interested in her sexually, particularly because she told him that their relationship would not be sexual. 25. It was her intention and hope that Black would serve as a mentor to her professionally. 26. Black, however, is a ruthless planner and a man that gets what he wants. It was not long before he managed to secure his ability to get Miss Geneva alone with him out of sight from the public or his own employees. 27. Once he did, Black forced sadistic sexual acts on her, some of which are described below without her consent and despite her saying no. 28. The first time it happened in 2008, Black took Miss Geneva to a studio apartment with a mattress on the floor and no other furniture. Black said that a young woman lived there. Humiliated and in shock, Miss Geneva never uttered a word about what he had done to her. 29. In a sad but predictable pattern for the next several years, Miss Geneva endured a cycle of intimidation, abuse, and humiliation by Black. 
that on numerous occasions included forced sexual conduct against her will. As described below, many of these instances were perpetrated by Black in order for him to indulge in sadistic sexual acts that were physically painful to Miss Genieva and to which she never consented. In addition to causing intentional physical pain, Black engaged in these acts because he derived pleasure from humiliating and debasing Miss Genieva. 30. After these acts of violence, Ms. Ganeva would tell Black to never speak to her or contact her again. Inevitably, after waiting weeks and sometimes several months being a master manipulator, Black would engage in remorseful and conciliatory behavior relentlessly until he could induce her to meet him again. 31. Black's persuasion tactics included endless promises in line with the mentor that she wanted him to be for her, such as to help Miss Ganeva's child's educational opportunities, to finance a movie for her that she could produce or direct, after convincing her that acting was too difficult a business, to purchase a townhouse and turn it into an art museum that Miss Ganeva could manage or be a director of, and to help her with an application to Harvard Business School because of his strong relationships there. Jeffrey Epstein also had strong relationships at Harvard. She believed his promises and, in fact, she was aware that Black had purchased an art gallery and hired another woman that he'd been sexually involved with to run the gallery. 32. Even during these periods of overt, remorseful, and conciliatory behavior, Black nevertheless engaged in textbook harasser conduct. Specific details about each instance of Black's derogatory and controlling conduct toward Miss Ganeva are too much to include in this amended complaint, but by way of example, only included such things as ubiquitous constant belittling, falsely accusing her of being jealous to deflect from his own hideous conduct, pretending not to listen to or understand Miss Ganeva when she said something he did not like, especially when it involved her attempts at cutting off communication, forcing her to walk behind him, forcing her to wait for his permission to speak, punishing her by yelling and screaming if she did not speak to him, quote-unquote, nicely, insisting that she speak to him in a pleasing, pleasant, or otherwise happy and nice manner, and yelling at her if she failed to do so, insisting that her text messages also be sufficiently pleasant, criticizing her appearance by saying she needed to lose weight or improve certain parts of her body, criticizing her clothing and makeup, berating her for refusing to agree to threesomes with other women in black, intentionally making her feel stupid and inferior to him, and physically intimidating her by such acts as clenching his fists, pounding nearby pieces of furniture, repetitive cracking of his knuckles, and otherwise using his formidable six foot five, three hundred plus pound body to intimidate her. Black's violent sexual acts against Ms. Ganeva. 33. Black, the powerful and ruthless Wall Street Titan, was also ruthless and overpowering in his sexual conquests. 34. Unfortunately for Miss Ganeva, during many, but not all, of her sexual experiences with Black, he blank, this is redacted, on Miss Ganeva in order to achieve sexual arousal and gratification. 35. Miss Ganeva made it known to Black that she did not consent to his abnormal and atypical behaviors. Black knew she did not consent. Now, there's a large portion of this redacted, and um, it is most likely graphic. 39. For the first time, Black, uh, the first time Black did this, Miss Ganeva had no idea what was happening. God only knows what that was. 40. On some occasions, the pain was so extreme that Miss Ganeva believed she lost consciousness or fainted. 41. The practice of physically hurting her, redacted, was something from which Black derived pleasure and arousal and knew caused Miss Ganeva pain and distress. The next uh, three allegations here are redacted. 45. Black, because of his abnormal and atypical sexual needs, was extremely concerned about keeping this information secret. At the same time, Black's violent sexual behavior was a powerful way for him to exert complete physical, mental, and emotional control over Miss Ganeva and her body. 
46. At all times, Miss Ganeiva constantly feared Black. When they were alone, she feared him physically and was unable to reject his sexual advances, too afraid to anger him or cause his temper to flare. There were times when Miss Ganeiva physically submitted to his physical force without saying anything, afraid he would seriously hurt her. 47. She experienced fear mentally and emotionally, even when not in his physical presence. She was always worried that she was not doing things exactly the way Black wanted her to do them. By way of example, Black had strong opinions about everything she did, from the way she spoke to him, to the tone of voice and what she said, to where she went on vacation and what job she applied for. In her experience, upsetting him was dangerous, and she did her best to avoid it. Now, this is another large redacted portion here. 49, the fear was exhausting, but Miss Ganeiva felt she could not disobey Black for fear of her physical safety. 50, upon information and belief, Miss Ganeiva was not the only woman who endured the specific sexual violence at the hands of Black. 51, one woman who was elected to be identified only as Jane Doe, quote unquote, was also a victim of Black, whom she met through Jeffrey Epstein. Now, Black's attorneys tried to get any references to Jeffrey Epstein removed from Miss Ganeiva's lawsuit against him, but the judge ruled that that material, uh, that that information is material to her claims, so he has not been able to remove references to his relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, 52, in 1999, Ms. Doe was a single mother living in New Jersey with her child and commuting into Midtown for a low-wage position as a receptionist. She had suffered some financial setbacks and was in credit card debt. 53, sometime in or around 2000, Ms. Doe was introduced to Epstein by an acquaintance, a Ukrainian woman. The Ukrainian woman had called Ms. Doe repeatedly, telling her that she needed to meet this rich man, that he could help her financially, and she wanted to give him Ms. Doe's number. She initially ignored these calls. However, Ms. Doe received calls from someone named Maxwell Gillen. This woman told Ms. Doe that she really should meet Epstein. He was a powerful businessman who could help her. At the time, Ms. Doe was trying to create a skincare product but needed financial help. 54. Eventually, Ms. Doe made an appointment with Mac Maxwell to meet Epstein. She did so one day after work. 55. When Ms. Doe arrived at 9 East 71 Street. Now, this is the um, big townhouse that uh, Leslie Wexner essentially gave Epstein, I think sold it to him for $1. And Leslie Wexner, as you all know, has never been indicted despite financing Jeffrey Epstein and his behavior and allegations of what was going on with L Brands and Victoria's Secret. She first met with Maxwell in an office, which had a large desk and an expensive-looking rug. Maxwell appeared busy and distracted, but made sure to tell Ms. Doe that she was going to be introducing her to Epstein, who, quote, picks models for Victoria's Secret, unquote, exactly as I just mentioned. This was strange to Ms. Doe, because although she looked much younger than her age and continued to do some modeling, she was no longer the right age to be seriously considered as a Victoria's Secret model. 56. When Ms. Doe met Epstein, he told her all about how he, quote, makes money for rich guys, unquote, and is a philanthropist. Read that as full-on rapist. As Ms. Doe thought about telling Epstein of her skincare product, Epstein said, quote, I am a massage slut. I get two to three massages a day. Lots of women do it, and they do very well. Epstein said he would pay Ms. Doe $300 to give him a massage and a bikini for 20 minutes. This was almost more than she earned in an entire week. Ms. Doe did so, and he paid her $300. He masturbated and wanted her to perform oral sex on him, but she refused. Over the course of months, including until at least December 2001, Ms. Doe gave Epstein massages on approximately three to four occasions. Each time, Epstein paid Ms. Doe $300. During these encounters, Epstein tried to convince Ms. Doe to perform oral sex on him. Each time, Ms. Doe refused. Epstein was not happy with Ms. Doe and said she needed to quote-unquote do more. As uh, Ms. Doe recalls being asked to go to Epstein's not long after September 11th, 2001. Boom! Who was involved with 9-11? We all know all people associated with the mega group. 
She was there in, with a number of other guests. The event stands out in her mind because Epstein made a vulgar and disgusting remark about the young model stranded in New York City after September 11th. Specifically, Epstein began talking about how bad it was for foreign models who had come for Fashion Week and now could not leave. He said the modeling agencies had stranded these women with no help or money. Disgustingly, Epstein remarked that these young girls, mostly teenagers, were in such dire financial straits, they would take $100 to get fucked up the ass. Ms. Doe also recalls that in early December 2001, this is the time Henry Kissinger pushed China into the World Trade Organization. She went to Miami to see the U2 quote-unquote heart tour. While there, Epstein called Ms. Doe out of the blue and asked her what she was doing. Ms. Doe told him she was just hanging out. Epstein said he was in Florida and offered to fly her back to New Jersey on his plane with him. Ms. Doe did not know how Epstein even knew she was in Florida. Ms. Doe told Epstein she had a plane ticket and politely declined. Epstein was insistent that she come with him. Ms. Doe refused, fearful of whether or not Epstein would actually fly her to New Jersey or elsewhere. It was clear that Epstein was angry at Ms. Doe for refusing to fly back to Florida with him. Following Ms. Doe's trip to Florida, Epstein called her several times to give him a massage. Ms. Doe declined, knowing that Epstein needed her to quote-unquote do more if he was going to pay her for a massage. However, a few months later, Ms. Doe was desperate and in, in need for money and called Epstein for help. Epstein sent a messenger who hand-delivered a card to Ms. Doe that contained $300. The card was engraved with the words, Compliments of Jeffrey Epstein. Ms. Doe did not have to give Epstein a massage for this payment. Shortly thereafter, Epstein called Ms. Doe and said he was going to introduce her to someone else that may be able to quote-unquote help her. Epstein did not provide a name and she did not ask. Ms. Doe agreed to come to Epstein's townhouse late one afternoon during the work week. There, Ms. Doe first met Black, still not knowing his name, in the hallway near the kitchen of Epstein's townhouse. He was in a business suit. He did not introduce himself. Ms. Doe and Black took the elevator up to the third floor together in Epstein's quote unquote, to Epstein's quote unquote massage room where Ms. Doe previously had given Epstein a massage while wearing a bikini. Black led the way. Once in the room, Black gave Ms. Doe $300, money she presumed was for a massage. Black appeared at ease, like he knew his way around the massage room and had been there before. Black took off all of his clothes, which she also believed was for the massage she was supposed to give him. Immediately, it was clear that Black had plans other than Ms. Doe giving him a, him a massage while wearing a bikini. He insisted that he wanted to orally copulate Ms. Doe and significantly pressured her to get on the massage table. Black was huge, over six foot four and 300 pounds. He made several vulgar and disgusting comments, including repeating something about the delicacy of kings or the delight of kings in connection with going down on a woman. The next thing she knew, Black spun her sideways on the table, pushed her in a backbend over the, uh, over the side of the table in an incredibly painful position. Quickly, it became extremely difficult for her to breathe. She had blood rushing to her head and she tried to yell out but was unable to. She was afraid that she would be dropped on her head. In shock, Ms. Doe had not consented to this violent and aggressive sexual act. Black then placed redacted. Ms. Doe was in terrible pain and had no idea what exactly he was doing to cause it. Ms. Doe was not sure if Black had forced some large, ter terribly painful object into her or redacted. She experienced tearing pain. Ms. Doe was in such agony she could barely speak or breathe. She had never experienced anything like that before. At some point, while she remained upside down, Black was quote unquote finished. When Black was finished, he got dressed as if nothing had happened. Ms. Doe went into the bathroom in excruciating pain from the R and in shock. She managed to get her clothes on and walk out of Epstein's home with Black. When they exited, Ms. Doe realized it was now dark outside. After Black and Ms. Doe walked outside, Black turned to Ms. Doe and said, I am Black. Ms. Doe looked at Black with a confused look because she did not know his name previously and thought he was referring to his race. Black then said, Black, my name is Leo Black. Ms. Doe then parroted Black by saying, my name is, and she gave her name. Black then pointed toward a town car and said, this is me. He got into the backseat of the car and drove away. Ms. Doe, who had no medical insurance, was left to deal with the physical aftermath of what he had done to her on her own. Her. 
V was grossly swollen and torn. She used ice and also took baths in an attempt to heal it. She used over-the-counter products to help with the pain and prevent infection from the cuts and tears. For several weeks, it was painful and difficult to go to the bathroom. Weeks after the violent assault, Black called Ms. Doe. She was shocked because she had not given him her phone number and assumed Epstein must have given it to him. Black said he wanted Ms. Doe to meet him in New York City for lunch because he just wanted to talk, quote-unquote. Ms. Doe refused, but Black was persistent. She eventually agreed to meet him for lunch in a public place. They met in a restaurant located in the basement of a 9 West 57th Street. Ms. Doe became upset when she saw Black and started reliving the R and S.A. She became so upset that she could not eat and began crying loudly. People in the restaurant noticed and looked at the two of them. Black was visibly concerned that Doe was making a scene and tried to get her to calm down, unable to do so. Doe left the restaurant. A few weeks later, Black called her again to see if she would meet him. Black said he just wanted to talk. He told her he felt bad, quote-unquote. Doe refused. He called again. She refused again. Finally, the third time he called, Black asked Doe to come meet him again and said he just wanted to talk and give her something. At the time, Doe was depressed and allowed herself to be convinced to see him. She said she would only meet in a public place. They met at a restaurant located in the lobby of St. Regis Hotel. It was a Sunday evening. The two sat down, and after a short conversation, without warning, Black simply placed an envelope in her lap. It contained $5,000. Doe was shocked. Black told her that the money was to help her with her credit card debt. Unbeknownst to Doe, this was a quote-unquote test. Predictably, not long after the dinner, Black called Doe and said, I want to see you. Doe asked why. She knew she would never allow herself to be in a position where he could physically harm her again. Doe asked him if he was trying to give her more money. Taken aback, Black exclaimed, I just gave you $5,000. Doe refused to see him again. She failed his test. A few months later, Doe was walking down the street when Black came walking out of an exclusive members-only restaurant. Black recognized Doe immediately and said to her, You look great. How are you? Doe answered quickly as she was fine and kept walking. A couple of weeks after Black R'd her, she confided in a friend about what had happened. This friend reacted poorly and told her that if she told anyone about what Black had done, no one would believe her. From then on, Doe decided she would not tell her story until now. Leon Black's public statements about his relationship with Epstein. There has been and remains much mystery surrounding the infamous Epstein and just how he became an ultra-wealthy and powerfully connected person. Indeed, Epstein had a modest upbringing in Coney Island, New York, did not complete college, and first, first worked as a high school math teacher in Manhattan. <clears throat> William Barr's father? Huh. Nonetheless, he somehow rose to become an extremely wealthy person with properties all over the world, including a seven-story townhouse in the Upper East Side, a private island in the U.S. Virgin Islands, a massive home in ritzy Palm Beach, Florida, and his own compound in New Mexico that he was allegedly building into its own city. Not only was he wealthy, but Epstein is believed to have had close personal ties to some of the world's most powerful politicians, businessmen, and celebrity figures, including but not limited to former presidents Bill Clinton and Donald Trump, Prince Andrew, Duke of York, billionaire businessman Leslie Wexner, and countless others. Mystery has also surrounded how Epstein received only a mild slap on the wrist, quote-unquote, despite operating an alleged sophisticated sex trafficking ring in Palm Beach, Florida. Numerous young women had come forward and accused him of engaging in essays with them while they were minors. Epstein ultimately pled guilty in 2008 to just one count of soliciting an underage prostitute. Children cannot be prostitutes and ultimately spent 13 months out of an 18-month sentence in Palm Beach County stockade. After renewed public outcry concerning Epstein's heinous conduct and the sweetheart prosecution deal he received in 2008, Epstein was arrested again July 6, 2019 when his private jet landed in New Jersey's Teterboro Airport. Manhattan federal prosecutors charged him with with sex trafficking and conspiracy to commit sex trafficking. 
Following Epstein's arrest, Black told Apollo investors, Apollo is the publicly traded hedge fund with over $400 billion in assets under management founded by Black, where he served as then chairman and CEO. During a July 31st, 2019 earnings call that he was, quote, completely unaware of and was deeply troubled by the conduct that is now the subject of the federal criminal charges brought against Epstein. On August 10, 2019, after he was denied bail, Epstein was found dead in his jail cell in the Manhattan Correctional Center, the MCC. New York's chief medical examiner determined that Epstein committed suicide by hanging, and I would say that that's questionable. Then on October 12, 2020, the New York Times published an article, Matthew Goldstein, Steve Elder, and David Enrick, the billionaire who stood by Jeffrey Epstein, revealing that Black, one of the world's wealthiest persons with a net worth estimated at close to $10 billion, had paid Epstein tens of millions of dollars after Epstein's 2008 conviction. In response, Black, in an October 12, 2020 letter to Apollo's limited partners, stated again that, quote, I was completely unaware of and continued to be a Appalled by the reprehensible conduct that surfaced at the end of 2018 and led to the federal criminal charges brought against Epstein. Quote, there has never been an allegation by anyone, including the New York Times, that I engaged in any wrongdoing or inappropriate conduct. Later that month, during October 29, 2020 earnings call, Black reiterated that, quote, there has never been an allegation by anyone that I engaged in any wrongdoing because I did not. And any suggestion of blackmail or any other connection to Epstein's reprehensible conduct is categorically untrue. Black also said, had I known of the facts about Epstein's sickening and repulsive conduct, which I learned in late 2018, more than a year after I stopped working with them, I never would have had anything to do with him. Following the October 12, 2020 New York Times article, Apollo hired the law firm of Detchert LLP to quote unquote investigate Epstein's ties to Black and Apollo. Yeah, if you're paying someone to do an investigation into yourself, gee, I might not believe what they come up with considering you're the one paying them. Detchert was also tasked with creating a report to submit to the SEC. On or around January 22, 2021, Dutcher released his report, which recounted Black's claim that while he was aware of Epstein's 2008 guilty plea, he, quote, understood from Epstein these offenses arose from a single instance in which Epstein had received a massage from a 17-year-old prostitute. Again, children cannot be prostitutes. Of course, it was widely reported Epstein had sex with countless underage girls and not merely a massage on one occasion with a child prostitute, which, again, is not possible. Children cannot consent to being prostitutes. Black claimed to Detchert that as a result of what Epstein supposedly told him about the nature of his conviction, he thought it would, quote, not be inappropriate to maintain a personal and professional relationship with Epstein, unquote, because Black believed Epstein had made a single mistake. Numerous prominent figures continued to maintain social and business relationships with Epstein, and because Black believes in rehabilitation and giving people second chances while name-dropping his relationships with Michael Milken and Martha Stewart. Black admitted to Detcher that up until the fall of 2018, he maintained a relationship with Epstein, whom he viewed as a friend worthy of trust that he confided on personal matters, attended social events with, and introduced to his family. While Black admitted he knew Epstein had eclectic tastes and often employed attractive women. He claimed he did not believe that any of the women in Epstein's employ were underage and was repulsed by the details of Epstein's crimes. Throughout Detchert's Alice in Wonderland narrative, the report repeatedly and conveniently emphasized that between the years of 2008 and 2010, quote, Black had no client relationship with Epstein at the time. The report further revealed Black paid Epstein between 2012 and 2017 a total of $158 million which Black claimed were payments made to compensate Epstein, who possessed neither a college degree nor any advanced degrees related to tax advisement or estate planning. Quote, for the overall value he believed Epstein was providing to him through Epstein's advice on trust and estate planning, tax issues, philanthropic issues, and the operation of Black's family wealth management office. 
despite taking on the appearance of a legitimate independent investigation, as Detcher must admit any quote-unquote conclusions contained in the report were based on nothing more than voluntary statements provided by willing participants, who likely prepared heavily with their lawyers about what they said and produced to Jet Detcher, and may have even had counsel present when they spoke to Detcher. Nobody testified under oath or provided sworn statements under the penalty of perjury, and it is unclear what acts if any Detchert had to all relevant documents and evidence. Further, these quote-unquote good Samaritans who volunteered to speak to Detchert were none other than Black's posse, consisting of Paul Weiss lawyers, supposedly the best and brightest legal minds in the world, who were consistently outshined by Epstein, who could only come up with a $2 billion tax solution for Black. Apollo Global Management Partners and Associates and other people with personal, professional, and or financial interest aligned with Blacks. Following the report, on January 25th, 2021, statement, Black maintained that, quote, I was completely unaware of Epstein's aberrant misconduct that came to light in late 2018 and repeated, I did not engage in any wrongdoing or inappropriate conduct. And what can only be described as the epitome of irony, disingenuine, disingenuousness and trolling, quote-unquote, based on how Black horrifically abused Miss Ganeeva. And upon information and belief other women with whom he'd been involved, Black also stated that, quote, having reflected at great length on my professional relationship with Mr. Epstein, I have also decided the one way I can begin to address the grievous error of having maintained a professional relationship with Epstein is to pledge $2 million toward initiatives that seek to achieve gender equality and protect and empower women, including helping survivors of domestic violence, SA, and human trafficking. Yeah, this is exactly what you see with these folks. The kinds of people who um, are inclusive and tolerant, they're actually predators. These are people who use virtue signaling as a shield to cover up their own disgusting behavior. Though Black has conveniently tried to distance himself from Epstein in the wake of Epstein's death and the revelation of more sordid details about Epstein's criminal affairs. And though Black has tried his best with the help of a well-crafted public relations and legal team to make it appear that his and Epstein's relationship was only professional, in reality, the two had an extremely close personal friendship and Epstein was Black's quote-unquote best friend. As detailed herein, this relationship regularly de devolved delved into nefarious waters and directly contradicts Black's statements to the public, to investors on the October 2020 earnings call, and to the lawyers at Dutchard. Black flies Miss Ganeeva from New York City to Epstein's home in Palm Beach, Florida, while Epstein was serving his prison sentence in the Palm Beach County stockade. One morning, in or about mid to late October 2008, to identify the precise date, which Miss Ganeeva cannot specifically recall, subpoenas have been served on Teterboro Airport for records of Black's flights to Palm Beach International Airport in this period, as well as on PBI for any records about Black's air travel. Additional subpoenas have been served on fixed base operations at PBI, aircraft hangar storage maintenance, refueling of the aircraft used for Black's turnaround flight. Miss Ganeeva, uh, Black picked up Miss Ganeeva purportedly to take her to lunch. After she got in the car, however, Black told her they were going, not going to lunch in Manhattan. Rather, he was taking her on a trip to Florida to see a friend of Black's. He refused to tell her where they were going, who they were visiting, or the reason for the visit. Black and Miss Ganeeva were driven to Teterboro Airport, located in New Jersey, where he and Miss Ganeeva boarded a small private jet. Once on the plane, Black told Miss Ganeeva that they, where they were going and who they were going to see. Black told her they were flying down to Palm Beach to visit his friend, Jeffrey Epstein. As referenced to above earlier that year, on or about June 30, 2008, Epstein had pleaded guilty to a felony charge of solicitation of prostitution involving a minor. After being jailed, full-time Palm Beach County stockade. At some point, approximately three months in, Epstein was permitted to leave the jail on quote-unquote work release for up to 12 hours a day, six days a week. You see that 
That's a special kind of privilege reserved only for members of the tribe. In addition to allegedly going to a work office, Epstein was permitted to spend hours away at quote-unquote doctor visits, as well as his Palm Beach home. Although Epstein pled guilty to one count of soliciting an underage prostitute, by the time he began his jail sentence, news about his sex trafficking ring had been widely reported on for several years. Additionally, several civil lawsuits had been filed against him. Evidence strongly suggested that Epstein operated a sophisticated sex trafficking ring which involved minors, including girls as young as 12 and 14, in which he and his associates would recruit and groom underage or economically disadvantaged girls and young women from West Palm Beach, Florida, and other surrounding areas to come over to Epstein's Palm Beach mansion in order to engage in sex acts with them. Repeatedly during the relationship, Black would confide in Ms. Ganeeva unsolicited that Epstein was his best friend, as it was a badge of honor for him. Notably, based on the timing of Black's trip to Palm Beach, Epstein would have only recently been allowed to leave the jail house on quote-unquote work release. Of course, whereas Epstein was known to have multiple sex partners a day, during the three months he could not leave jail, Epstein conceivably had less ability to engage in sexual conduct with women. During the flight to Palm Beach, after Black disclosed where he was taking her, Black sternly warned Miss Ganeeva not to tell anyone that he was flying her down to meet with Epstein. Disgustingly, Black threatened that he would plant drugs on Miss Ganeeva and frame her for a crime if she did talk about it. When Miss Ganeeva said such threats would not work on her, Black doubled down on his threats, acknowledging that planting minor drugs on her would probably not be problematic, but said he would frame her with possessing very serious drugs and would make her family and son ashamed of her. Black specifically used heroin as an example of an illicit drug that would be problematic for her if he planted it on her. Afraid to make him angrier, Miss Ganeeva did not talk back. It is deeply concerning that Black's scheme to bring Miss Ganeeva to Epstein's home was something he planned and did do without her knowledge. It was wholly without her consent, and even worse, by the time he told her, Miss Ganeeva was powerless to do anything about it. Black's threats to frame her for a crime, i.e. by planting drugs such as heroin on her, is behavior that falls squarely within the definition of New York Penal Law Section uh, 230.34, Sex Trafficking. A person is guilty of sex trafficking if he or she engages in a scheme by means of instilling fear into the person, accusing some persons of a crime or cause criminal charges to be instituted against some person. After arriving at PBI, a driver affiliated with a car service picked up Ms. Ganeeva in black in a dark car, possibly a Mercedes-Benz manufactured vehicle, and drove them to Epstein's Palm Beach mansion. When black and Ms. Ganeeva arrived at Epstein's home, Ms. Ganeeva saw that there was a sheriff deputy standing outside the door. Under the terms of the work release program, a prisoner like Epstein was required to pay for the services of a sheriff's deputy or similar law enforcement officer who would escort and monitor the prisoner while they were on quote-unquote work release. Black even confirmed to Miss Ganeeva that the man was a prison guard hired to escort Epstein to and from his work release. The deputy smiled sheepishly at Black and Miss Ganeeva as they entered Epstein's home. Uh, it was later disclosed that Epstein paid the sheriff's office more than 128000 for off-duty deputies wearing business suits to guard Epstein while he was on work release. Additionally, the office for the nonprofit at which Epstein allegedly worked turned out to be the office of Jack Goldberger, one of Epstein's defense lawyers. The quote-unquote supervisor responsible for monitoring Epstein's work previously had submitted sworn filings with the IRS that Epstein worked one hour per week for no pay. The same supervisor as part of Epstein's application for work release represented Epstein would work six days a week, 12 hours a day. Black and Miss Ganeeva were greeted by Sarah Kellen. Miss Ganeeva had never met Kellen before and had no idea who she was. Media reports have described Kellen as a close associate and lieutenant of Epstein's. Some reports have described her as one of Epstein's victims, who also happened to work for him. No, she was not a victim. Kellen is thought to be one of the unindicted co-conspirators in Epstein's sex trafficking ring, shielded from prosecution under Epstein's 2007 non-prosecution agreement with the government. 
Kellen has also been described as Epstein's personal assistant, who scheduled and managed the teenage girls and young women who came in and out of Epstein's houses, including collecting contact information, taking messages, arranging travel, and escorting the girls and women to Epstein's room. Prison records also show Kellen repeatedly visited Epstein while he was in prison. Kellen has not been criminally prosecuted for her role in Epstein's sex trafficking ring. Kellen, however, has been identified and her alleged conduct described in detail in numerous civil lawsuits filed against Epstein. For example, one civil complaint states Epstein's plan and scheme reflected a particular pattern and method. The underage victim would be brought to Epstein's mansion, where she'd be introduced to Sarah Kellen, Epstein's assistant. Kellen would bring the girls up a flight of stairs to a bedroom that contained a massage table. The girl would then find herself alone in the room with Epstein, who would be wearing only a towel. Now, the reason why they use women, why they use Gillen, why they use a Sarah Kellen is to make the young girls feel safe because there's another woman there. It, but that other woman is participating in the abuse. And quite frankly, this was an espionage operation, a blackmail honeypot operation. And Gillen Maxwell was the real operator of this network. In fact, I believe she was using her father, um, Israeli super spy, Robert Maxwell. I believe she was using his network. Ms. Eva soon found herself alone with Black and Epstein in a room that appeared to be an office. Black and Epstein were situated close to one another, each facing Ms. Eva, while in almost supine positions as they were waiting for her to get on top of them. Indeed, Black indicated with his eyes he wanted Ms. Eva to come and lay in between him and Epstein. Alarmed and shocked, Ms. Eva remembers standing in front of them, unable to say anything, while they just stared up at her, saying nothing but clearly expecting her to do something. As she continued to stand there in silence, Black became visibly annoyed. He eventually told her to leave the room. After Black said this, Kellen suddenly appeared and Miss Ganeeva took Miss Ganeeva into what appeared to be a living room. Kellen first tried to make small talk and asked Miss Ganeeva for her email address because she wanted to send her a good website to shop for clothes. Kellen then sat Miss Ganeeva down and in a soft but a serious but soft feminine tone said, quote, you have to understand that Jeffrey and Leon are sex addicts. You have to let them do whatever they want with you, and you have to let them be with multiple sex partners if that's what they want. They are very powerful, and if you don't do what they want you to do, there will be consequences that I do not want for you. Kellen again said to her, you know, something may happen to you, as her voice trailed off. Although Epstein was on work release, the heightened scrutiny of his behavior and whereabouts made his earlier pattern of cycling in underage girls from economically disadvantaged homes in West Palm Beach on a daily basis, sometimes three or four girls a day, no longer an option. Since he was being monitored by law enforcement, he needed to be more discreet and could not merely enlist his associates to procure for and bring him the same young, often underage women he was accustomed to having sex with. Although Black knew better than to ever actually say aloud why he brought Ms. Ganeeva down there all the way from New York City to Epstein without her consent at the time, Ms. Ganeeva was caught off guard and too bewildered to appreciate exactly what was happening to her. Ms. Ganeeva was disgusted, and she let Kellen know this. Ms. Ganeeva knew that by not submitting to Epstein, she would cause Epstein and Black to be very upset and that there would be consequences for her refusal. Soon thereafter, Black and Epstein came into the room where Miss Ganeeva sat with Kellen. The four of them sat around a table with Black on Miss Ganeeva's left, Kellen on her right, and Epstein across from her, where they could look directly at her and size her up. Any attempt, uh, in attempted, an awkward conversation was made. Ms. Ganeeva recalls saying something about the financial crisis and remarking about the federal government's bailout of large financial institutions and the impact on jobs. Black made a comment about a couch he'd bought for Ms. Ganeeva's apartment. Epstein asked her a question and creepily referred to her as love. Kellen then, in front of the men this time, brought up again her earlier comment about how Black and Epstein are addicted to sex. This time, in response to the comment, Ms. Ganeeva said sex addiction was like any addiction and that you want to have it more often and with more frequency, but at some point it will catch up and affect your life. Ms. Ganeeva noticed that her voice was getting louder and she became very self-aware she was in a precarious situation. It is no wonder that Black refused to tell her about this planned trip until they were on the aircraft. Black was bringing her down to Florida without her consent to satisfy the sex needs of Epstein, his quote-unquote best friend. When it became clear that Ms. Ganeeva would not be engaging in sex with Epstein, 
Epstein and Black became angry and upset with her. Not long after, Black and Miss Ganeva left Epstein's home and went back to PBI. Black was so furious, he refused to speak to her. The visit lasted no more than two hours. Back on the private plane, Miss Ganeva was silent, still shaken from her encounter with Epstein. Black, visibly angry with Miss Ganeva and her refusal to submit to Epstein, did not speak to her, but forcibly shoved food into her mouth. While this was the first time Black brought Miss Ganeva to meet with Epstein, it was not the only time Epstein crept into their relationship. Beginning in 2005, police in Palm Beach, Florida, began recovering phone messages taken from Epstein's trash. These trash pulls yielded phone messages about the daily activities taking place at Epstein's Palm Beach home, including dozens of messages about scheduling and arranging girls to come to 358 El Rio Way for the purpose of providing topless bikini bottoms only or completely naked massages. According to deposition testimony, a Palm Beach detective, Joseph Ricari, on June 21, 2016, the phone messages provided critical evidence that led to the identification of the identities of underage victims. Question to Detective Ricari. When you would see females' names and telephone numbers, would you take those telephone numbers and match it to a person? Ricari, we would do our best to identify who that person was. Um, question. And is that one way in which you discovered the identities of some of the others that soon came to be known as victims? Ricari, correct. See notice of documents ordered unsealed. Um, in Jeffrey versus Maxwell. Question to Detective Ricari, did you find names of other witnesses and people that you knew to have been associated with the house in these message pads? Ricari, yes. Question, and so what was the evidentiary value to you of those message pads collected from Epstein's home in the search warrant? Ricari, it was very important to corroborate what the victims had already told me as to calling in and for work. Included in the phone messages that were introduced as evidence in multiple civil cases against Epstein as well as Galen Maxwell was the following message from Miss or for Mr. Epstein. She need to I can't read that phone number something or other and then two parts are redacted. This message taken by Epstein's housekeeper Luella uh, Rabor on February 24, 2005 at 11.19 a.m. said that a female had called for Leon because she needed his number and left her number. The female's name and number were redacted. At a minimum, the message reveals that as far back as 2005, Epstein's Palm Beach housekeeper knew Black as Leon and considered a part of her daily duties to take messages for Leon about an exchange of phone numbers with a woman and to pass such information to Epstein. Upon belief, the Palm Beach police were responsible for making the redactions of names and numbers from the phone messages obtained in trash pulls that were produced in various civil court proceedings in the above message. Despite Black's public statements to the contrary, Black would regularly boast about how great a friend Epstein was. He would regularly regale Miss Ganeva with stories about Epstein's New Mexico compound with wonderment and reveal how Epstein flew around pretty and very young girls in his private jet, which Black described as just jaw-dropping. In particular, Black appeared most impressed by how Epstein was allegedly creating his own town in New Mexico, which he said meant Epstein would have his own schools and be in control control of his own hospitals and have his own police force. Black seemed enthralled by the power and authority Epstein was amassing in this town that Epstein envisioned and captivated by how Epstein would effectively be above the law there. On one occasion, Ms. Ganeva asked Black how Epstein makes his money. Black bizarrely told her he takes care of the little girls. Quote unquote. When Ms. Ganeva gave Black a puzzled look, Black stared into her eyes and repeated that Epstein does take care of little girls, using a condescending and suggestive tone and said he was doing a great job with it. Ms. Ganeva understood this to mean Epstein, widely regarded as a master manipulator and a fixer, or someone who makes arrangements for other people, especially of an illicit or devious kind, was providing Black with advice and resources to help manage the women Black was involved in outside of his marriage. Of course, that included Ms. Ganeva. Included in the idea of managing such affairs was the implied reference to ensuring that Black's secrets remained secret.
Indeed, on many other occasions, often while Black was texting with Epstein, he would reiterate to Miss Ganaeva how his best friends were Jeffrey Epstein and Harvey Weinstein, the disgraced Hollywood film producer and convicted sex offender. Worse, Black would mention these men were helping him to do Miss Ganeva. When asked what he meant by this, Epstein said, or Black said that Epstein and Weinstein gave Gary very good advice and knew how to take care of problems. Black would also tell Miss Ganeeva that Epstein and Weinstein were recording her and even making a movie about her. In an effort to veil his threats, Black would chide her and say, What kind of director do you prefer? As always, Miss Ganeeva took his threats seriously. She believed that if she disobeyed Black, he would make good on his threats. If she did not, however, there would be consequences. Um... Such comments were yet another reference to how Epstein, and apparently also Weinstein, provided Black with advice about how to manipulate and control Miss Ganeeva and uh, the other women with whom Black was involved, some of whom are discussed below. Black also made multiple comments to Miss Ganeeva about Epstein's sexual proclivities, dispelling any notion that Black did not know the true extent of Epstein's depravity. By way of example, in early 2014, while at a cafe in New York, Miss Ganeeva criticized Black's relationship with Epstein. Black rebuked her. Superfluously, he said, quote, you are too old for Epstein. He likes them young, adding he wouldn't be interested in you. Black once similarly made a comment about a woman with whom he allegedly had been having a sexual relationship. This woman, Jane Doe One, was an attractive Russian-speaking woman and only a few years older than Miss Ganeeva. Black referred to Ms. Doe One as now being too old for him. Black also told Miss Ganeeva that Epstein had an attraction to ballerinas. Disgustingly, Black boasted to her that he introduced Epstein to dancers at a ballet company that Black had connections to, and to which Epstein had apparently donated money. Appalled, Ms. Ganeeva never asked for more information. Black constantly made it a point to remind Miss Ganeeva about how close he was with Epstein, how well-connected Epstein was to rich and powerful people. Black wanted her to believe that he was behind her introductions to other powerful men who had ties to Epstein, including Prince Andrew and the aforementioned Weinstein. Based on Black's best friend status with Epstein, it is certain he knew Gillen Maxwell. Maxwell has been dubbed as Epstein's madam and has been charged by the federal government with the crime crimes of enticing minors and sex trafficking of underage girls, stemming from her connection to Epstein's sex trafficking ring. Among other criminal acts, Maxwell has been accused of personally recruiting and grooming underage girls and young vulnerable women to have sex with Epstein and his friends. In the fall of 2013, Ms. Ganeva was approached by Maxwell at a restaurant and lounge. On the day in question, Maxwell aggressively tried to speak with Ms. Ganeeva and told her she wanted to make Ms. Ganeeva a global citizen. Maxwell told her she wanted to help her get a passport and that she must call her. Maxwell then handed Ms. Ganeeva her business card. Ms. Ganeeva had no idea who Maxwell was or that she was connected to Epstein and thought her behavior was intrusive and bizarre. Ms. Ganeeva never contacted Maxwell. Upon information and belief, Black had pushed Maxwell on Ms. Ganeeva, likely through Epstein, as Ms. Ganeeva repeatedly rebuked Black's attempts to help her with her immigration status, which would only have pulled Ms. Ganeeva further within Black's grip and control. Notably, on multiple occasions, including during the 2015 discussions in which Black pressured Ms. Ganeeva into agreeing to sign an NDA, Black threatened Ms. Ganeeva against talking about Epstein and Epstein's relationship with Black. Black warned that Ms. Ganeeva would die, quote unquote, if she ever spoke about Epstein and Epstein's relationship with Black, and that he would pay people to destroy her life if she ever did so. For many reasons, Black's claim that Ms. Ganeeva attempted to extort him by threatening to make their relationship publicly known, which allegedly induced him to pay her money, is provably false. Perhaps the biggest flaw in Black's manufactured narrative is that, like Ms. Ganeeva, Black made no attempt to keep secret the many women with whom he was involved throughout the years. As he often bragged to Ms. Ganeeva, Black had a quote-unquote conveyor belt of women available to him. Black did not attempt to keep these women hidden from anyone, much less his family. Black openly traveled in social circles, including with Epstein, where men with excessive wealth like him had access to an endless supply of women. 
uh, young, attractive women. It was no secret among those that knew Black that he had a preference for Russian-speaking women, including many like Ms. Geneva, who were young, had modeling experience, and may have newly arrived in the U.S. and did not have extensive family or a support system here. Quite simply, if Black was trying to hide the fact that he was involved with women other than his wife, including young Russian-speaking models, he did an extremely poor job, particularly for somebody who founded and ruthlessly ran a publicly traded global hedge fund with $400 billion in assets under management. Worse, there were occasions where Miss Geneva found herself attending the same social functions as Black and his wife. Black made absolutely no effort to keep his wife and Miss Geneva away from one another. Black openly pursued Miss Geneva at these events in front of his wife. By way of example, only this included an event in the Hamptons that took place in the summer of 2011. In that same summer, Black brought Ms. Ganeeva over to his home in the Hamptons and tried to convince her to sleep with him in the house. When Ms. Ganeeva asked Black where his wife was, he told her she was in the main house. In other words, Black brought Ms. Ganeeva in his home in order to sleep with her in what was apparently a guest house, all while his wife was next door in the main house. Well, we're going to leave it at that. I'm going to include the link to this. You can read the rest of the amended complaint for yourself. But let's move on to some other things. Um, in her sex abuse lawsuit against Leon Black, who's Al Eva claims the billionaire took her to Epstein's and that she met Sarah Kellen. Um, in a new court filing, Black claims Kellen will testify that this isn't true. Black's new complaint, Ms. Kellen will testify at the appropriate time she took place in no such meeting and had no conversation. Uh-huh. This revelation is part of Black's amended complaint against Ganeeva, her, uh, her law firm, Apollo co-founder Josh Harris and PR executive Stephen Rubenstein. Black claims they formed an enterprise to stage a coup against him at his private equity firm. Right, right. So I will include the link to that thread as well. Moving on. Um, this is uh, Gumby for Christ saying, FYI, Leon Black's father acquired United Fruit in a bidding war with George Bush's CIA cutout, the Pata. Black later paid a 1.25 million bribe to Honduras military dictator who was then ousted in a military coup within days of Black's own mysterious quote unquote suicide. Very interesting, right? Yeah, CIA owned United Fruit. This is a CIA cutout. Why did Leon Black pay Jeffrey Epstein $50 million? He paid him much more than that. This is, of course, the same United Fruit for which the Dulles brothers were board members for years, using the company to help stoke CIA-backed coup of the democratically elected Arbanz government in Guatemala in 1954. We'll also talk about Kofor Black, who is an associate of Leon Black's uh, that was CIA-connected. Apollo loaned $187 million to Jared Kushner's family's real estate firm. Volume 5 of the Senate Intelligence Committee Russia report establishes that Leon Black accompanied Trump to his, during his 1996 visit to Moscow to pursue real estate deals. Very interesting indeed. Black committed to help Russia set up $10 billion of the Russia Direct Investment Fund, RDIF, four years later. After Russia invaded Crimea, the U.S. Treasury imposed sanctions on the RDIF. Uh, Kirill Dmitriev, CEO of the RIDF, it was Dmitriev who met in the Seychelles Island with Eric Prince. You can see Leon Black here sitting next to Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump down here. Very interesting. Leon Black owns Blackwater. Uh, Kirill Dmitriev, CEO of the RDIF, met in the Seychelles Island with Eric Prince. Epstein, Black committed to help setting up the investment fund, blah, blah, blah. We saw that. Uh, Black, Prince, Russia, Jared, RDIF. Apollo bought Constellus Holdings in 2016 for $1 billion. Constellus is a private military contractor that was created as the result of a merger between rivals Triple Canopy and a Academy. Academy is the new name of Blackwater in 2014. Academy, founded by Eric Prince, formerly known as Blackwater, is best known for its role in the Nassau Square Massacre, where Blackwater guards killed at least 17 Iraqi civilians and injured 20. 
Black reportedly met one-on-one -on -one with Vladimir Putin to discuss Apollo's plans for investing in Russia. Where it is reported on September 16, 2011, that Black was on stage with Putin at an economic forum in Sochi where he agreed to serve on the International Advisory Board of the Russia Direct Investment Fund, a sovereign wealth fund that Putin was setting up. Black served on the advisory board of the RDIF until 2014. Also recruited to the advisory board was Stephen Swarchman, a of Blackstone Group, David Bonderman of TPG. The report also said Black knows Oleg Deripaska, the Russian oligarch, and had interacted with him in Russia in the U.S. prior to Deripaska being sanctioned by the U.S. in 2018. Black also knows Alan Vine, according to the report, who Black described as consigliere to Suleiman Karimov, another Russian oligarch sanctioned by the U.S. in 2018. Mr. Black and his companies paid millions in fees to Southern Trust Company, which Jeffrey Epstein set up in the Virgin Islands in 2013, according to three people briefed on the matter who spoke on the condition of anonymity because they were not authorized to speak publicly. Epstein had told territorial officials that Southern Trust was developing a DNA mining service, although he said the company would have a financial arm. Financial reports filed with the territory show Southern Trust collected $184 million in fees from 2013 to 2018, although it was not clear how much of that came from Leon Black. Black also told the committee on two occasions he'd spent time talking to Stephen Bannon, the former Trump advisor, including when he had breakfast with Bannon because they have a common friend who he went to see one morning and found Bannon there. Black also told the committee of a personal but not close friendship relationship he had with both Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump and about a business transaction between Apollo and Kushner companies that Black was not involved in or aware of until quote unquote after the fact. It was stated specific it wasn't stated specifically in the report, but in November 2017, after Joshua Harris, Black's partner, met numerous times in the White House with Kushner, Apollo lent the Kushner companies $184 million to refinance a Chicago skyscraper, according to the New York Times. We have a Vanity Fair article here, What Was Leon Black Doing with Trump in Russia? The Billionaire Investors 90 Real Estate Jaunt, complete with Georgian Feast and a disco discotheque and maybe a strip club drew scrutiny from senators investigating Trump's Russia ties also of interest. Black's more recent dealings with Putin, Bannon, and Kushner. This is an article from November, uh, September of 2020. Some interesting things in here if you actually take the time to go through it and read it. Here we have some more interesting stuff. Prior to his death, Epstein was building a DNA mining company with scientists from Harvard and MIT. Now a geneticist who met with Epstein and worked with the Epstein-funded Harvard program is chief scientist as, as the Biden administration builds a national DNA surveillance platform. Lovely indeed. COVID surveillance and sequencing. Leon Black gave millions to Epstein's DNA data mining company, Southern Trust, in 2013, despite the fact that Epstein was a convicted child sex offender, according to three people briefed on the matter who leaked the information to the New York Times. The only known employee of Epstein's DNA database company was Cecile De Jong, who is the wife of former governor of the Virgin Islands from 2007 to 15, John De Jong, who turned a blind eye to Epstein's serial child abuse for years. Oh, there they are pictured with Obama. I don't think Launder, uh, Lander was working directly with Epstein's DNA database company, but it's possible that technology Lander helped develop was used at Southern Trust, as if it was a real company. Regardless, Lander's repeated ethical failure should have disqualified him as OSTP director. Biden's chief scientific advisor, Eric Lander, claims to have been open about his ethical transgressions. However, Lander was content with hiding his association with Epstein until photos of them together were discovered on deleted websites. You can see them there. As the newly confirmed Director of Science and Technology, Epstein-linked geneticist Eric Lander will oversee the Biden administration's dystopian $1.7 billion plan to build permanent infrastructure for nationwide genomic surveillance. Proof that OSTP Director Eric Lander worked with the Evolutionary Biology Program at Harvard, which was solely funded by Epstein with nearly $10 million. Lander has not explained his affiliation with PED or his relationship with Martin Nowak. 
Leon Black and Epstein were friends with billionaire Pepe Fanjul. Pepe and his brother Alfonso are lifelong CIA assets who helped the CIA in their effort to overthrow Castro in Cuba in the 50s. The Fanjul family now runs a vast sugar empire out of West Palm Beach in the Dominican Republic. There's Leon Black, Fanjul, and Epstein together. Fonjul family built their sugar empire by trafficking people, including kids for, kids, for brutal plantation work, severely polluting the Everglades and bribing politicians. Naturally, they got along great with people like Epstein, Gillen, Maxwell, and the Clintons. Aw, look how nice. Fonjols also worked closely with the Bush family and corrupt Venezuelan oligarch Gustavo Cisneros, who is linked to the Clintons, Epstein, etc. Hard to think of a better cover for drug smuggling operation than a vast sugar enterprise in Central America. Oh, Gustavo Cisneros donated at least $1 million to the Clinton Foundation from 2009 to 13 and was appointed to Haiti's Presidential Advisory Council by Bill Clinton following the earthquake in 2010. More about uh, info about Pepe and Alfonso Fangel's work with the CIA and Alan Dulles in Cuba through Operation M. Cheering M. Fast, which recruited Cuban exiles to lead the coup against Castro. Lovely stuff here. You're right, the insider trading was done by members of the tribe. They're talking about insider trading after 9-11, it was Bernard Buzzy Congrad. Whilst he was chairman of Alex Brown, Inc., he went on to become executive director of the CIA. He married Cheryl Gordon, who was a high-level executive for the Zionist Leon Black's Apollo Global Management. So these are, of course, the CIA ties uh, to... Um, Leon Black and his relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. Very bizarre stuff indeed. Uh, we know he has a serious predilection for Russian women, Russian girls. Epstein also had a Russian pimp who we will talk about in another video that was operating out of Ukraine. I think this is why Ukraine is so important to these people. I believe they were using it as a sex trafficking hub as well as money laundering and many other things. So this has been a long video. I know that over an hour long, but I thought it was interesting to do sort of a deep dive on Leon Black, his relationship with Jeffrey Epstein and the allegations from uh, a former model, um, Geneva, Geneva, that he was dating, who is now suing him. I will include all the links to this in the video description below. Let me know what you guys think about this.